So with that, I'll, I'll do some questions. And Simon, would you take your place up at the podium? Sure. All right, so these are rapid fire. Okay. Okay, this is the bonus round. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> 60. Why do they call these books gospels when they are anti-Christian? They, they call themselves gospels, I suppose, because by that time, the gospel was, on the, on the one hand, a type of book, a, a type of book which records the teaching of Jesus, and a type of book which records the teaching of Jesus which by which you get salvation. And so that's why these Gospels call themselves All right, gospels. rapid question answer. What are the strongest arguments against some recent New Testament studies which attempt to place Thomas in the first century? The idea that he has pithy statements that are more likely early than late, etc. Well, I think p pithy statements are no, no more likely to be early or late. And some people have argued that some of the, some of the versions are earlier because, thing, because things start short and get longer, uh, but also things can start long and get shorter. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that, to me, the fact that Thomas talks about uh, Jesus criticizing circumcision, uh, Jesus, quote, Jesus quoting Paul's letters, I think, you know, those are some of the reasons why I would say it's... Like, and along that line, uh, um, if the Gospel of Thomas is a book of sayings, could the saying, uh, the Logia, about blessed is the man who came into being before he came into being, actually be Jesus talking about himself? That's very interesting. That's how Cyprian understood it. That's how Cyprian Cyprian understood, Cyprian understood it. Uh, Jesus didn't really sort of talk about himself as blessed. I don't, it would be a very unusual... I mean, he very commonly uses... Blessed is he who, to describe the disciple. I can't think, and there are lots and lots of examples of those. It would be unparalleled, I think, for him to say, blessed is he who, in reference to himself. Why would any legitimate scholar give these gospels serious consideration? That's a very good question. Um, I mean, I think there are a number of impulses to, to, to that. I think uh, partly there's a desire to, there's always a great interest in new discoveries not only by the Mail on Sunday or by Dan Brown, but also among scholars. And, 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 and scholars who work on, work on a particular document often exaggerate the importance of that particular document because that's, you know, how they've made their career um, sometimes. And, and, and um, there's, a, there's, a, there's often a desire to say something new, you know, to get a grant from the NEH or whatever it is. <laughs> you, you, you can't get a grant from the NEH, NEH by saying, I want to argue that the the New Testament Gospels show that Jesus died for our sins. You know, you, 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 but you can get a grant by saying that the Apocryphon of James gives us vital information that helps us understand the Jesus tradition. Given life expectancy differences between then and now, what's the likeliness someone was alive by the Gospels who was a witness to Jesus? Well, I think, I think if you, um, at, at the time when John's Gospel is written around AD 90, uh, um, you would have to be I guess, 80, 85, 90 to be, uh, to be alive to do that. And there were people, there were plenty of people who, who lived that long. And uh, I mean, not as many as today, but, you know, the Greek playwright Sophocles lived, to, lived, to, lived, lived into his 80s. Polycarp, the early church, lived into his 80s. And the second century tradition about John's Gospel is that it was written by a very old man in his, in, you know, in his 80s at the, at the end of his life. Within, the old, or within church history, among the Reformers, some suggested that the Old Testament Apocrypha could be read with profit, even if they were not canonical scripture. Do you think the same could be said of these Gospels you've discussed tonight? No. Are these Gospels... <laughs> this is rapid fire. Are these Gospels ever called by other names, i.e. Gospels, since it gives the impression of equality with true Gospels? Are they ever called other things by... Well, let, let me ask it this way, because you've kind of answered that before uh, in the Q&A. Do the New Testament Gospels call themselves Gospels? Well, um, Mark's Gospel begins with the, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Mark's Gospel sort of sets itself out as, as, uh, as the Gospel. What about Matthew, Luke, and John? Well, they're following in Mark, on Mark's model. So although they don't call themselves Gospels, they're sort of carrying on in that tradition. Have any fragments of writings in the period between New Testament writings and the Gnostics, say between 90 and 140, that could relate to Jesus been found? 
Not really. Oh, come on. Well, I mean, you get the Didache. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Fragments in that sense. Yeah. I mean, works have works have survived from from that period. Yeah. One Clement, I suppose, is one major one. Yeah. The Didache. One Clement dating from around ninety six, ninety eight. The Didache, early second century. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So people can go find stuff in that interim period that's actually produced by the church, if you yeah, will. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you if you go if you Google or put on Amazon Apostolic Fathers, then you'll oh, find, this is a good question. Find okay. A volume of books. Sorry, I'm interrupting. We got to keep moving. Uh, why do you think these gospels were written? Were they an attempt to counteract, damage the spread of Christianity, an attempt to pick out good aspects of Christianity and incorporate them into regional folk religions? Were they con men looking to make a buck? What was going on? Well, I think whenever, often today we can find kind of forms of Christianity which look strange to us. And it's, it's because a fundamental point of Christian doctrine has been adapted too, too, too much to... to to fit the particular culture that they're in, and I think that's what happened with the apocryphal gospel. Do all the uh, apocryphal gospels deserve to be labeled Gnostic? No, I mean, I, there, there are different ways in which scholars use the term Gnostic, and, um, and, and Mark and David have used it in a sort of broad sense of, of world-denying and, uh, um, and ascetical, perhaps. Um, I sort of take a, a, a narrower view that, uh, that Gnostic refers to a view where the creator God is not only uh, weak, like in the Gospel of Philip, but actually evil. And I think that's the way in which the Church Fathers, both the Church Fathers actually and Platonist philosophers from the early centuries talk about the Gnostics. So Plotinus, the uh, Greek philosopher of the third century AD, uh, writes a book against the Gnostics and he, he, start, he, he, he calls it against, well, someone else calls it, one of his pupils calls it against the Gnostics. What he called it was against those who see the world and the, the, person, the, the God who made the world as evil. Uh, so that's, that's a kind of nice summary statement, I think, of Gnosticism. Thank you. God bless you.